good and evil created he them. The Devil and the Trombone by Martin Gardner The university's chapel was dark when I walked by it, but I could hear faintly the sound of an organ playing inside. I glanced at my wristwatch. It was almost midnight. Strange, I thought, that someone would be playing at this hour. I was on my way home from a meeting of the Campus Philosophical Society. As an assistant professor of political science and co-author of a textbook on international relations, I had been asked to chairman a symposium on right and wrong in international law. It had been a technical, tangled discussion, and my brain was tired. Partly to rest my mind, partly out of curiosity, I pulled open the heavy chapel door and entered. The church was pitch black inside, except for a dim glow of light behind the pulpit where the organ console was concealed. The Gothic walls and windows reverberated with low, sonorous chords. I struck a match so I could find my way to a seat in the rear, where I settled into a comfortable position and listened. The chords were unlike any chords I had ever heard. It wasn't long until my curiosity got the upper hand. I stood up and felt my way slowly down the central aisle. Then I stopped suddenly and caught my breath. The light was coming not from the bulb above the music rack, but from the organist himself. He was young and handsome, and he was wearing a white robe. Two enormous wings extended from his shoulders and were folded close to the body. The wings radiated a hazy luminescence. He glanced over, saw me standing there, and took his hands from the keys. The chapel was instantly silent. You startled me, he said, smiling crookedly. How did you get in? I pointed down the aisle. Through the, the front entrance, I stammered. He frowned and shook his head in self-reproach. My fault, he said. I thought the door was locked. I didn't say anything. It's not often I get a chance to play one of these things, he went on, adjusting several stops. I'm horribly out of practice, but here's something that might interest you. His fingers began to move gracefully over the keyboards, and the somber chapel suddenly became alive with melody. And while he played, a great peace settled over my soul. The world was good, life was good, death was good. All that seemed black and horrible was a necessary prelude to some greater goodness. Every episode of history was part of the will of God. I thought of the German prison camps, of the bombing of Hiroshima, of the atomic wars yet to come. They too were good. Then, from the deep purple shadows behind the organ, a tall figure with pointed ears emerged. He wore no clothing. Dark, reddish hair covered his swarthy arms, chest, and legs. In his left hand, gleaming like silver, was a slide trombone. He put the instrument to his lips and blew a low, outrageous note like the sound of a Bronx cheer. At the same moment, the organist lifted his hands from the keys. The dark man played alone, beating a foot slowly on the stone floor and improvising in a relaxed New Orleans style. The melodic line was filled with sweeping glissandos. And now my soul was troubled with a great unrest. All that we call good in life, I saw clearly, was nothing but an illusion. Sickness and sin were the realities. The brief moments of peace and harmony for a person, nation, or the world only added pathos to a final tragedy. At the end of human history, loomed the blankness of a great destruction. Then the slender hands of the organist returned to the ivory keys, and the two players began to jam. They were improvising independently, but their separate efforts blended into a rich texture of counterpoint and polyrhythm. All the frenzied fullness and complexity of the modern world 
with its curious mixture of good and evil, rose up before me. I felt neither peace nor anxiety, but a strange excitement and exultation. There were journeys to be made with real goals to reach, real dangers to avoid. There were battles to be fought. A sinewy tail crept from the back of the dark man. The cloven scarlet tip crawled into the bell of the slide horn, serving as a mute. The organist looked at me and grinned. Authentic tailgate, he commented. The jamming continued. One by one, the age-old problems of political philosophy found clear and simple answers. Right and wrong were easy to define. International dilemmas melted away. I saw the good and bad of every nation. I knew exactly what our foreign policy should be. The organist's hands and sandaled feet were dancing wildly now, and the dark stranger was bending back, the trombone pointed upward in defiance, playing loud and wicked smears. My head felt as though it had expanded to the bursting point. I understood the meaning of life. I knew why the world had been created. I was about to penetrate the ultimate mystery, the mystery of God's own existence, when the players stopped abruptly. The chapel was quiet as a tomb. My hands were shaking and cold trickles of perspiration ran down my face. There was a dull ache above each temple. It's a good thing we stopped, the dark man said huskily. Another note and your brain would have cracked. You'd better go back to your seat, said the man in white, and wake yourself up. In dazed obedience, I stumbled back along the aisle, sat down again, and closed my eyes. When I opened them, the soft glow in front had disappeared. I walked to the console, fired a match, and waved it about in the blackness. Not a soul was in sight. I placed my hand on the leather cushion. It was cold. There were no feathers on the floor. My wife was reading in a chair when I got home. Sam, she called to me. I had gone to the bathroom to take some aspirin. I'm worried about Joey. He disobeyed several times tonight, and he refused to go to bed until an hour after bedtime. Do you think we should start punishing him? I washed down a couple of tablets with a glass of water. My dear, I said, drying my lips on a towel. I haven't the faintest idea.